Brother Ricky said, I got a video on play that's just like you. And then he told me it's crazy people. So now listen, I'm proud to be one of those crazy people. Can I get an amen? We're so glad that you're here. It's been, a, it's been an unusual week for me. I've been in Atlanta all week. And let me tell you, the world needs more crazy people. Amen. The world needs to hear that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. And the words in red are true. Amen. But I got to tell you something interesting. I thought while I was gone, I'd stay in touch with the deacons. And so I thought I'd call them all. We'd just have a, a little group chat and, and thought we'd just read some scripture together. So uh, I was reading one night and, and I was talking about Abraham and Lot. And I read this, and a man named Lot was warned to take his wife and flee out of the city. But his wife looked back and turned to salt. And after a few seconds of dead silence, Brother Ronnie said, I got to ask you a question. I said, okay. He said, what happened to the flea? <laughs> Y'all, the rest of you will get it later. F-L-E-E, F-L-E-A, Okay. <laughs> And y'all know we've had some repair work done at the church, and I think they opened up an account down at the local hardware store. And Connie was going over the receipts of some things that they bought, and she found one that was signed by somebody that she didn't understand who it was. She couldn't read it, so she called down there, and the guy said, uh, let me look at it. So he, he looked at it, and he said, ma'am, said, all I can tell you is that somebody named Christian signed that. Connie said, well, I ain't paying it. We have no Christians at Friendship Baptist Church. <laughs> So you got to watch Connie. I want to ask you to stand to your feet, please, for the reading of God's Word. And we're going to pray this morning first. Dear Heavenly Father, God, as we head into Holy Week, Lord, help us to remember exactly what you did. Lord, help us to remember that you are one of those crazy people. The world called you crazy. They laughed at you. Lord, you knew exactly why you were coming. You had a plan and you had a purpose. You had a passion for what you were doing, God, all because you loved us. And Lord, you rode into the city on a donkey and they were singing and praising you. And then just days later, God, they were hollering, crucify you. Lord, help us to realize today that we need to be singing praises to you. We need to be lifting you up for what you did for us. And God, that just gives me cold chills right now. Because God, you deliberately went to that cross. You deliberately died for the sins of the world. God, you did something you didn't have to do. God, you had no sin. You had no penalty to pay, and yet you paid it for us. And Lord, today I pray that we would have a fresh revelation of what you did. That God, you would touch our hearts and our minds like never before. That God, we would leave here changed today. That we would leave here closer to you, dear Heavenly Father. That we would leave here seeing you high and lifted up. And that God, we would pray to be one of those crazy people that would go out into the world and dare to tell the world that Jesus loves them. Lord, let us make a difference in the lives of each one that we touch. And God, I pray that if there's someone here today who is just playing with this Christian thing, that they're just talking the talk and they're not walking the walk. They're one thing on Sunday and a different thing on Monday. God, I pray that you would convict them in such a way that they would repent today and say, God, help my unbelief. Now, Lord, I thank you for this little church by the road. I thank you, God, for what you have done here. I thank you, God, for what you are doing, and I thank you for what you're going to do. But, God, keep us close to you. Keep us humble, and let us always lift up the name of Jesus Christ. And all of God's people said, Amen. Turn with me to the book of Mark, the third chapter. We're going to see a very interesting story here. Mark, the third chapter, and the 21st verse is what I want to focus on. But I want to give you a little background history, and I hope you don't mind standing. I think we need to be more reverent for God's Word. Jesus is doing a lot of healing at this time. Jesus is doing miracles, and the whole world at that time is seeing Him do miracles. And you know what's going on? I'm going to put it in plain English. The religious leaders of that day are mad. They're trying to figure out ways to get rid of this Jesus. Let me tell you, the world is trying to stomp out the name of Jesus today, but it's never going to happen. Jesus told his disciples, he said, I want a boat close by just in case they try to get me so I can leave. 
And the Bible says, if you read the third chapter of Mark, that he is touching and he is healing people. And let me tell you how smart the demons are, that when he would cast out the demons, they would cry out to him as King of kings and Lord of lords. They know him. They know who he is, and they have to obey him. But I want you to get this picture. He's doing all this, and the people are seeing him, and I want you to look at what it says now in verse 21 of Mark, the third chapter. But when his own people heard about this, what this, what he was doing, they went out to lay hold of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. You may be seated. The world says we're crazy. Did you know that? And let me tell you what, if Jesus was here today, the world would look at him and say he's a fanatic. They'd say this man is crazy. He needs to be locked up. They would probably try to put him in an insane asylum and they would, they would probably put him in a, in a straight jacket kind of like this unlucky fella up here. That's how I felt this past week in Atlanta. Our perspective on things is warped. We want the world and us to look alike. You know the church has brought the world in. Did you know that? And it started way back when. When God called his people out. You know what his people wanted to do, Ronnie? They wanted a king. They wanted to look like the world. And the church is the same today. The Bible says we are to be a peculiar people. We are to be those crazy people that go out into the world. And so let me tell you what Jesus did for me. We're to be those crazy people that say, hey, yes, life is tough, but God is good. Amen. The world today says, let me come into the church. Let me show you how to do this Jesus thing better. Let me show you how to make people happy. Let me show you how to get their money. Let me show you how to get a great name. Listen, my friend, they were calling Jesus crazy, his own people. Did you know that? The Bible says that his word, Betty, is going to divide families. Brother against brother, brother against sister, mom against dad. The Bible says that God's Word is a powerful force. It's like a two-edged sword. It'll cut you going in and it'll cut you coming out. I tell you one thing, little church by the road here, we are going to follow the Bible. I don't care what the world says. I don't care if the world says it's right. If God's Word says it's wrong, it's wrong. They gave us a little coin down at uh, in Atlanta little coin here and it's got thumbs up on one side and got something on the other side and they said if you don't know what to do flip the coin they looked at me and they said you gonna flip the coin I said I'm gonna flip the pages because the Bible is my answer the Bible tells me what's right and what's wrong the Bible has the answer to all my problems and to all my questions so why would I want to take a chance and flip the coin when I got the truth right here and it is always accurate but see, the world today wants us to look like them and act like them. And we want to look like them and act like them. I'm sorry. But I want to ask you a question. What if we just changed one word? What, what if we instead of saying crazy like they call Jesus? Let's just say Jesus. How many of you believe Jesus was not crazy? Amen. Amen. Okay. Let's change that word crazy. How about saying he was passionate? How about that? He was passionate. In fact, they call this Passion Week, the passion of the Christ. What is passion? Passion is something that you believe in dearly, that you love, and that you hold on to at no cost. I pray today that the little church by the road is a passionate church for Jesus Christ, that we hold on and we never let go and we never waver and we always proclaim the truth. The speakers that I heard this past week were passionate about their job. They were passionate about what they were talking about. And, and some of them even dressed weird, kind of like I am today. <laughs> Brother Don, eat your heart out, buddy. <laughs> I knew I was in trouble this morning before I got dressed. She said, uh, what do you think? I said, uh, about what? She said, about what I laid out for you to wear. I said, I hadn't seen it yet. But hey, I, man, I love my wife more than I love the color of my clothes. So. <laughs> These people there, they stood out. They, they were dressed different. Some of the folks in the hotel was scratching their heads laughing. 
you know, because they were passionate about what they were doing. And so today I want to look at some people in the Bible who were considered to be crazy, but to me, they were passionate. <clears throat> now, let me ask a question before I get to these people. What are you passionate about? What are you passionate about? I can tell you what some of you are passionate about. Connie's passionate about bowling. She likes bowling and she likes target shooting, buddy. And I wouldn't dare make her mad because she might hit me with a bowling ball and then shoot me. <laughs> Barbara is passionate about cleaning. And so is Sherry. In fact, this is a true story. Come home Friday night, get home, hadn't seen Sherry in a week. She comes up and she hugs my neck. And she says, boy, I missed you. And by the way, the house stayed a lot cleaner without you here. <laughs> true story. True story. So... <laughs> So now I have been delegated to the back porch. <laughs> David, number four, Butch and Mary, they're passionate about Alabama football. How do I know what they talk it? They wear it. And that's okay. Nothing wrong with that. David Charles is passionate about pools in the fire department. In fact, I got behind the fire truck the other day, and I'm thinking, where, where David Charles is? But he wasn't down there. Brother Hugh, he's passionate about old graveyards and, and preserving the history, and, and that's great. David Ponder and Ricky Neese are passionate about guns, and, and the list could go on. So what are you passionate about today? What are you passionate about? We're going to look at some people real quickly that were passionate. Turn with me to 1 Samuel, 1st chapter. 1 Samuel, 1st chapter. Probably, Ricky's probably going to have it on the screen. I want to talk to you about a, a lady named Hannah. And I want you to write this down. Hannah had a personal passion. 1 Samuel 1 and 8. <clears throat> then Elkan, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is it that your heart is grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Now, his hus her husband he cares about her. She's depressed. She is wanting a child. Back in those days, a woman who was childless was looked down upon and, and, and a woman who had a child loved that child and, and, was, and was revered. And listen, y'all, I'm going to throw this in. We need to revere mothers more, and we need to revere the children more. We need to stop killing our children. Amen. Just going to throw that in. But her husband cared about her, and he said, Hey, am I not, am I not better than ten sons? And then look at verse uh, 2, or verse 9. So Hannah rose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. And now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of her soul. She was desperate. She, she has a personal passion here. And she, she prayed to the Lord and she wept in anguish. She was so intent. She was weeping. When's the last time you weeped over something that was really important? Like the, your children being saved? When's the last time you weeped over that? Verse 11. <clears throat> Then she made a vow and said, O God of hosts, if you will indeed look at the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. She is saying, God, I love you so much. If you will give me a child, I will raise him in a godly manner. Man, we need more mamas like that today. And it happened, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli watched her mouth. Now, he is the priest, y'all. He is the religious leader, okay? And now Hannah spoke in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. Listen, y'all, she is in such deep anguish. She has so much private passion that she is talking to God in her mind. Her lips are moving, but no words are coming out. Because listen, God don't need your words. He needs your heart. He thought she was drunk. And Eli said to her, how long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. And Hannah answered and said to him, no, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit, passion. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. She had a personal passion. She knew what she wanted, and she knew that God was the only one who could answer her prayer. Listen, my friend, God is the only one who can answer any of our prayers if they are godly prayers. 
What do I mean? He's the only one that can heal. He's the only one that can save. He is the only one that can restore. He is the only one that can give you peace. And you notice I didn't mention anything about worldly stuff. Listen, he's already pr promised to provide for us, and there's not a one of us in here that don't have more stuff than he promised to provide. Can I get an amen? She knew he was the only answer. Do you have a prayer today that you know God is the only answer for? Why are you not getting passionate about it? See, in America, we have become a microwave prayer society. What does that mean? I got three seconds, God, and I got to go. Okay, God, I prayed you got an answer. Listen, God wants us to get passionate with him. Jesus got alone with the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he was so passionate about talking to the Father that he sweated drops of blood. And medical science says that's possible if you are so passionate and intent upon what you're saying. Once again, God's word is proven true. Well, I don't think my children will ever be saved. With an attitude like that, they never will. I don't think God hears my prayers. With an attitude like that, never will. The Bible gives us an example of a woman who went to the judge and said, I need this, I need that. And the judge kept putting her off. She was persistent. And finally the judge said, if you leave me alone, I'll give it to you. Listen, God wants us to be persistent in our prayers because we have to come to the point where we know he can answer, he will answer, and he's the only one who can answer. She was passionate. She went to the temple early in the morning. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, this past week, I, I, y'all know I get up early, and I, and I got up and I had my normal Bible study time, and I, and I go down. The first day, nobody's down there. I was 30 minutes early for the breakfast, and I sat down there, and I drank coffee. But the next morning, I get down there early. Not only was the breakfast ready, but there was a guy sitting there who I know needed Jesus, and he asked me to come over and sit with him. And he said, are you going to bless the food? Yeah, I'm going to bless food. And God opened the door to share with this guy. Why? Because I wasn't laying around in the room. I said, God, I'm here. I want you to use me. That was my prayer all last Sunday. God used me in some way to spread your love. And I believe he did. But I was passionate about it, and Hannah was passionate about it. And, and today, she was focused on talking to God. She didn't care that the priest was there. She didn't care that anybody saw her. She didn't care what he thought about her. She could not care less about anything other than getting to the great I Am and touching the hem of his garment. And Eli is supposed to be the priest. Listen, my friend. Just because somebody stands up in front of a group of people and says he loves the Lord, that does not mean it is true. If he preaches anything other than this word, he is a false prophet. I didn't say that. The Bible said it. That's why you need to know the word. That's why you need to get into the scripture. Eli was not worried about God. He was looking on the outward signs. And listen, y'all, God is going to work in mysterious ways that you don't understand. Because if you can understand God, he's not God. So she was passionate about it. And Eli said she's either crazy or drunk. But you know what? She didn't get offended. She just said, hey, I'm talking to God. I'm talking to God. I wish we had that boldness. Let's go to the next one. Number two, Jonah. And Jonah had a situational passion. Write that down. Situational passion. In uh, Jonah, the first chapter, first verse. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Get up! Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because this wickedness has come up before me. Then you go down to verse 3. However, <laughs> Jonah got to flee, got up to flee to Tarsha, away from the presence of the Lord. How stupid is that? And he went down to Joppa and found a ship bound for Tarsha. So he paid the fare, went aboard to sail for Tarsha, away from the presence of the Lord. Now, he had situational passion. What does that mean? We're going to get to that in a minute. Now, I want you to get this picture. Here's Jonah. God comes to him and says, I want you to go. Listen, I don't care where God tells you to go. You're not going to get away from God. 
You're going to go. You're either going to go kicking and screaming or you're going to go praising. Amen. Just one or the other. So Jonah says, well, I know better. I'm going to get out of the presence of God. <laughs> I'll tell you something you never thought of either. Had Jonah gone down to Nineveh to preach, I made a loop, okay. Had Jonah gone down to preach, he wouldn't have had to pay the fare. So not only did it cost him time, right? It cost him money. And you're going to find out in just a second that it cost him a lot more. It cost him three days of his life inside the belly of a big fish. And if you don't believe that story is true, take it up with God. I believe it's true. I believe God can make anything he wants to make. He made this fish to come swallow Jonah. But Jonah was passionate about hating the Ninevites. Passionate about hating the Ninevites. And you know what he was saying here? God, I'm right about the Ninevites. You're wrong. Okay? And, and I've shared with this church before, there's some certain type of people it's hard for me to witness to. And y'all know, you know, uh, we'll talk about that before. And lo and behold, when I check into the hotel last Sunday, that's the first one I ran into. That type. God has a way of saying, you're going to obey me one way or the other. So not only did it cost Jonah his pride, and it cost him his money, and it cost him his time, it also caused him a lot of grief. But Jonah is saying, God, I hate the Ninevites. You don't know them like I know them. I know them are a wicked people. They're never going to hear you. And, and listen, we can make all kinds of excuses of why we can't witness. Hello? Well, that guy's always been an alcoholic. My, my Bible says God can turn an alcoholic into a God-fearing man. That person's homosexual. My God says, I'll clean you up put your feet back on the right path. That person will never listen. He's never listened before. God says, I'll get his attention when the time is right. So Jonah says, God, I'm going to get away from your presence. There's only one place in the world, in the universe, that you can go to get away from God's presence. And that's in hell. Now think about that. That's how smart Jonah is. And we're the same way. God, you don't know me. I can't go down there and witness that person. Well, I can't talk good. That person doesn't like me. I don't like that person. God says, listen, listen, you do not have to do it. I'm sending you there, but I will do it. So Jonah gets on the ship, you know that, and they hit a storm. And listen, God will put roadblocks in our paths to get our attention. He's going to get your attention one way or the other. Ask me how I know, because he has whipped me many times. And I'd rather my mama whip me than, than God whip me. My mama would just warm up my hiney. God would whip the whole body and the soul. Amen. I'd be like Hannah. I would be in despair. I'd be like King David. My bones are aching. Anyway, Jonah's on the ship, and, and, and it's about to sink. And finally, he, you know, he says, hey, throw me overboard, and everything will be okay. And, and, and so they grabbed him, and they threw him overboard. Would you have done that? Just a question. Just a question. That's a whole other sermon. They threw him overboard, this big fish, whoop, swallows him up. Don't you know it smelt bad in there? Woo-wee. Man. But now, Jonah has situational passion. What does that mean? Now his passion turns from hate to help. <laughs> now think about it. He was hating like the Dickens. I'm not going. And now his passion has turned to help me, God. Did that sound like us? God, I'm in a mess. I'm in the belly of a fish. Oh, listen. I don't care if you're on the highest temple. I don't care if you're in the hospital. I don't care if you're in the belly of a fish. God knows where you are, when you're there, and how long you're going to be there, and he is able to reach you. Can I get an amen? amen. Help, God. Doesn't that sound like us? Well, we're rocking along good, and everything's perfect, and all of a sudden the rug gets jerked out from under us, and we're in the belly of a fish. Help. Maybe, maybe I was wrong about them Ninevites. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe I ought to listen to this God, okay? And this is what's amazing. This shows you the love of God. When Jonah got to praying, and you go to the second chapter of Jonah, and you ought to read it, it's a pretty prayer. It is a beautiful prayer. And Jonah prays it. You know what God does? God answers it. 
God caused this big fish to go up on the bank. How did he do that? I don't know. Well, that's impossible. Nothing is impossible with God. And he vomits him up. How many have ever had to clean up vomit? Not pretty, is it? Can you imagine this prophet? He's covered in head to toe. He is a sight, man. He looks like Sherry when she gets up in the morning. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Our granddaughter says Sherry scares her when she gets up in the morning. So. <laughs> oh, me. What happens? Jonah goes and preaches a message. And then what happens? Revive. What if, what if God says, Sherry, I want you to go witness this person. And Sherry goes kicking and screaming. But she goes, and that person gets saved. Isn't that a blessing from God? But let me tell you what Jonah did. Then Jonah got mad again. Why? Because he had situational passion. Deep down, he did not care about the Ninevites, even when he went to preach it for them. He was obeying God. Okay? Now, listen. There is a difference. And I want you to listen to this very, very clear. If you are obeying God strictly to make God happy, not because you love him, you're doing it for the wrong reason. I'll say it again. You obey God because you love God. Amen. You do not obey God to get blessings. Amen. This prosperity gospel is a lie from the pits of hell. God loves you. God is not a genie in a bottle, and he's not like a, like a computer program. If you push this button and pull this lever and turn this knob, he's going to bless you. That is not God. God said to obey is better than sacrifice. What does that mean? Too many of us are obeying because we feel like we have to. That is sacrifice. They had to make sacrifices in the Old Testament. We don't have to make sacrifices because Jesus is our sacrifice. Can I get an amen? amen. We obey because we love. Amen. See, and here's what happened. Here, here's what we don't talk about. When Jonah got upset that they got saved, listen, the people were still, still they still had revival, Okay. Who missed the blessing? The people? No. Jonah. Jonah missed the blessing. And, it, and it's like, I, I, when I got to witness to that guy the other day, I come out of there just so happy. I got to witness somebody that, first of all, I don't like to witness to those. And second of all, uh, I, I used to worry what I'd say. And third of all, God opened the door. And now the, now the responsibility's on God. So Jonah... <laughs> Is a lot like us. We don't want to cry out until we need help. And now I want to talk to you about a third person. And this is a guy named Judas. Write this down. Judas had a greedy passion. It was all about him. All about him. I'm going to tell you an interesting story. In John, the 12th chapter, <clears throat> y'all know the lady come to where Jesus was and she broke the alabaster box and she put the expensive perfume on his feet. Now here sits Judas. Now Judas walked with Jesus Christ. Just because you say you walk with Christ does not mean you have a relationship with Christ. But I'm going to read to you from John. Now you've got to get this picture. She broke this box. She put it on his feet. She is worshiping Jesus Christ. And here's what Judas said in 12, 12 and 6. And he said... Not that he cared for the poor, but because, and listen to this, he was a thief. And he had the bag, and he bare what was put in there. Let me tell you what that means. Judas was the treasurer, okay? Listen, Jesus had money. How do you know he, <gasps> Jesus had money? He did have money. Judas was the treasurer. you got to have money to be a treasurer. Can I get an amen on that? And he stole from the treasury. So he was a thief. And then you go to, back to verse 5 of John 12, and it says, why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. Now listen to what Judas is saying. Judas had a greedy passion. He was a thief. 
And he is condemning somebody who is worshiping Jesus all because he says, oh, I'm, I'm going to be so righteous here. We could have took that money and helped the poor. He never helped the poor in his life. How do I know? He was a thief. What does a thief do? A thief steals, okay? A thief does not care. We have a greedy passion too, do we not? It's all about us. Here's what we say. I did this. I did that. We're always pointing people to us. Listen, we need to point them to him. He's the one that paid the price. He's the one that hung on the cross. He's the one that first loved us. Judas said this, Jesus, your way is wrong, my way is right. Doesn't that sound like us? Listen to people when they talk. Listen to the personal pronouns that they use. And how they're always trying to lift themselves up and not Jesus. I'm going to tell you, if you see anything good in me, and I'm talking about myself personally now. If you see anything good in me, it is not from me, it is from him. I am a wicked person. The Bible says that. We don't know how wicked we are. It's by the grace of God that you are saved. It's by the grace of God that Jesus saved you. But here's what Judah said. I want it my way. I, I, want the, I want you, Jesus. I want you to come. You have the power, and I want you to take over, and I want you to defeat Rome, and I want you to set up an earthly kingdom here. That's what I want. Doesn't that sound like us? Well, that's my church. I've been going to that church 50 years, and there ain't nobody going to tell me what to do in my church. Listen, Sparky, this is not your church. This is God's church. Hello? He died for it. He, <laughs> here again, I know I'm not real bright, and, and, I, and I accept that. But I cannot understand why somebody wants to run a church. It makes no sense. The Bible says I can't even run my own footsteps. But here's Judas saying, Jesus, you're wrong. Now, he had seen Jesus do all the miracles that the other disciples had. And yet, he's got himself focused on himself. And listen, y'all, you can come to church. You can hear the wonderful sermons that God gives us. It's not me, it's him. You can feel the Spirit here, but you can still go out of here self-centered and focusing on me and not on him. It has to do with repentance and a change of heart. Amen. The Bible wants us to be teachable. How about that? Yes. Yes. How about that? And I know when I was young, I was hard to teach anything. I was hard-headed. And I know some of you are still hard-headed. But God, if you go to God and say, God, how about this? God, help my hard-headedness. He will. He will show you things that you cannot imagine. And we all know what happened to Judas. He, well, Bible, somebody, he, Judas repented. No, Judas did not repent. Judas repented that it didn't go his way. Peter had true repentance. You go to people in the jail, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, they're sorry they got caught. They're not sorry they did the deal. They're not sorry they broke the law. They're sorry they got caught. That's the same thing with Judas. But I want to go to one now, and I'm going to let him do all of his own talking because he can do it better than me. But I want you to turn to Acts, the 26th chapter, and I want to talk to you about a man named the Apostle Paul. And I, I want to tell you that Paul, and write this down, Paul had teachable passion. Teachable passion. Now let me sum this up. Listen to what it says in Acts. I want to read one verse, then we're going to read pretty much the whole chapter. But in Acts 26 and 24, it says this. <clears throat> now as he's thus made his defense, Feta said with a loud voice, Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. Paul was also called crazy. Hello? So let me set this up. Paul was very passionate about being a Jew. Did you know that? He was very zealous about being a Jew. He wanted to be the best Jew that he could be. I wish we had some Christians that wanted to be closer to God than they could be. Wouldn't that be great? But he was raised to be a Jew. He was raised to know the law. He was very passionate about the law. He was very passionate about stopping this Jesus movement. Do you know that? 
He wanted to stamp out this Jesus movement. And he was not bashful about it. He was bold. And he is headstrong. <clears throat> and Paul had reasoned in his mind that he was right. That's what he'd been taught. And you're going to see in just a minute in his own words that he gives his pedigree. And listen, he had a great pedigree. He was going to be a Jew amongst Jews. He was going to be the top dog. He, he, he was going to be the man. And he was passionate about being that Jew until he met Christ. And he went then, listen to this, Paul went from being uh, teachable about the Jews, he went from reason to revelation. What's the revelation? That Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And now in Acts 26, he is standing before King Agrippa. And this king has the power to kill Paul, or at least he thinks he does. Now let me give you a little background on King Agrippa. King Agrippa was a Jew. Hello? The Roman people had put him in charge to keep the Jewish people in line. And King Agrippa knew the Jewish law. Did you know that? We're going to see. Paul says in a minute, so you know it, buddy. You know the law. So here he is before King Agrippa. And what does Paul do? Does he back down? He's still hard-headed. He's still strong-willed. But his passion has changed. Why? Because he met Jesus. He, he was taught about being a Jew from day one. And he was taught the law. But then he met Jesus and he was taught something else. What was he taught? That the law can't save you. That this Jesus is who he says he is. That he is the Messiah. He is the one that the prophets told us about. And so now Paul has teachable passion. And I wish we had teachable passion here. I wish that we, once we learn and God reveals to us his word, that our passion changes. He gets more toward God and less from what I think, Ronnie. Because I can tell you, and I guarantee you, it's the same is true of you if you'd be honest and admit it. There were things in the Bible that I just knew, I knew. But when the revelation hit me and God taught me, I was totally wrong. And, and you know what was amazing? God didn't condemn me for being wrong, Ronnie. He loved me and taught me right. Amen. Yes, See, the Galatians, the Galatians had this problem. And Paul said, who has, who has bewitched you? Because now you're trying to take the grace of Jesus Christ and you're trying to add Judaism back to it. It is not that way. It is either grace all the way or Judaism all the way. It can't be no mix of it. Listen, it is not you plus Jesus Christ. It is Jesus Christ and Him alone. It's not Jesus Christ plus the Baptist church, y'all. It's not Jesus Christ plus anything. It is Jesus Christ and Him alone when He was on that cross and He said, it is finished. What does that mean? He finished it all. I've been wanting to preach all week, y'all. All right. Y'all got time for this? Okay, I don't even know what time it is. I have not looked at my watch. Okay. Okay. Uh, is that where I started, Ricky? Go to the next one. Listen, I thought I put, did I not start in 26 and... Didn't I start in 26 and 1? All right, let's start on 26 and 1. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you're permitted to speak for yourself. So Paul stretched out his hand and answered for himself. He said, I think myself happy, king. How can he be happy? He's, in, he's arrested, y'all. He's in chains. The Jews have wanted to kill him. How many of you know that doesn't look good on your resume? Hello? I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because today I shall answer for myself before you concerning all the things which I am accused of by the Jews. 
Especially, listen to this, because you are an expert in all the customs and questions which have to do with the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to hear me patiently. Paul says this, King, you are a Jew amongst you. You know the customs, you know the laws. I have been accused of all this stuff. They want to kill me. Hey, they wanted to kill Jesus. Tell you what Jesus said. Jesus said they hated him, they're going to hate us. Don't think it's strange. Look in verse 4. My manner of life from youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own nation, at Jerusalem, all the Jews know. Everybody knew Paul. Well, he was Saul then. They knew me from the first. If they were willing to testify that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made, listen to this, by God to our fathers. Now, he, now Paul is saying this, I'm standing here proclaiming what was promised to our fathers by God about the Messiah. But before that, Paul says, I was the strictest Jew. I, I was the Jew, man. He, was, he, he, he had a big B. He, if he was a Baptist, he'd have a big B on his shirt where I'd have a little B. He was a big Baptist, okay? <clears throat> Verse 7. And to this promise, our twelve tribes, earnestly serving God, night and day, hope to attain. For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. Why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead. What's he saying? King, God can raise the dead. Why should it be hard for you to think about that? Why should it be incredible? See, when, when Jesus raised Lazarus, you know what happened? Not only did they want to kill Jesus, they wanted to kill Lazarus. Now, how stupid is it, Connie, to think that you can kill somebody that just raised somebody from the dead? Okay? <laughs> And to kill the guy he just raised from the dead. He'll just raise him back from the dead, y'all. Doesn't that make sense? But this is how Satan blinds you. And he says, King Agrippa, how hard is it to think? How hard is it to realize that he could raise us from the dead? <laughs> All right, where am I here? Verse 9. Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And this I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. You know what he's saying? I put them in prison, I killed them. That's what he's saying. I had the authority, and you're going to see that in just a minute. This Jesus thing, I'm going to stomp it out. <laughs> Satan tried that in the garden too, it didn't work. Oh, let's see here. Verse 11. And I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme and being exceedingly enraged against them. I persecuted them even to foreign cities. He said, look, I persecuted every Christian I could find. I would torture them. Now this is, this is Saul who became Paul, y'all. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. He was not a Sunday school choir boy. Hello? I persecuted them. I tortured them till they blasphemed. I chased them. I went after them. <clears throat> and while thus occupied, <laughs> as I was journeying to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest, I got papers in my pocket. I can kill any Christian that is going against Jewish tradition. That's what he said. At midday, O king, along the road, I saw a light from heaven. Praise God for the light of God. Amen. Brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me saying in Hebrew language, now he's hearing it, nobody else heard it. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goad. A goad was a sharp stick that they would use to punch the oxen to get him to move forward. And that ox, that when that ox was in, in, in harness, he couldn't kick backwards. If he did, it was hard for him. And that's what he's saying. You can't, it's hard for you to kick against me. I am the one in control. Let's see. And I said, who are you? Now listen to this, Lord. <laughs> Think about that. 
This is Saul of Tarsus, the one who hated Jesus. The one who was persecuting Christians. And he says, be like me walking up. Who are you, Frank? Lord. Lord. He would not have called Jesus Lord five minutes before, y'all. Think about it. And he said, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which have seen and of things which I will reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people, as well as from the Gentiles, to whom I now send you. Listen, y'all, if it wasn't for Paul, there'd been no Gentile person saved. I don't care what you say. God had a plan. <clears throat> to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among you who are sanctified by faith in me. Now listen, now Paul is, Paul is telling King Agrippa all this. And he says, now therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and to them of the Gentiles, that they should repent, turn to God, and do the works befitting repentance. For these reasons, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. Therefore, having obtained help from God to this day, I stand witnessing both to small and great, saying no other things than these which the prophets of Moses said would come, that the Christ would suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead and would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Now, as he thus made this defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul you are beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. That's what the world looks at us and says, you folks is crazy. You folks is crazy. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus. But I speak the words of truth and re reason. For the king before whom I now speak freely knows these things. For I am convinced that none of these things escaped his attention since this thing was not done in a corner. What he's saying is, I have been very open about this. I have not tried to hide it. I have not been a closet Christian. It would be like the man that he come to church on Easter and Christmas. And at Christmas when he got ready to leave, the pastor pulled him over and said, I'd really talk to you about getting in the army of the Lord. And the man said, preacher said, I am in the army of the Lord. And the preacher said, well, you only come on Easter and Christmas. And the man said, I'm in the secret service. See, that's how some of us are. But Paul did it all out in the open. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe the prophets, King Agrippa. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. See, Paul had teachable passion. Paul went from being a zealous Jew to a passionate Christian. Why? Because he met the truth. Don't be deceived by a lie. Don't listen to what your parents and grandparents says if it don't line up with God's Word. I'm sorry. It's got to line up. It's got to be the truth. And it's okay to say, God, listen to this, y'all. This will, this will revolutionize your walk with God. God, I'm wrong. God, I was wrong. And you know what? God will say, I was waiting on this. I was waiting on this. Now just crawl up here in my lap now and let me tell you a few more things. But see, King Agrippa said an amazing thing. Today you almost persuade me. To be almost persuaded is to be totally lost. We don't know what happened to King Agrippa. The Bible doesn't tell us. But I do know this. I know he died. And if he, if he died with that same mindset, I can tell you where he is right now. Well, preacher, you're judging him. No, I'm not. I'm just telling you what the Bible says, what Paul said. Paul said, you must repent. You must confess. You must believe. You must turn from your wicked ways. That's what Paul said. 
So what kind of passion do you have today? Do you have a passion to see your family saved? Do you have a passion to get closer to God? Listen, y'all, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm very transparent. <clears throat> I, I have a lot of phobias, and everybody y'all here know that. And I hate to travel. Y'all know that. I went to Atlanta kicking and screaming. I was going to be down there with nobody I knew, no way to leave. I was, I was there for a week. But you know what? God was with me. God had a plan. Now, I don't know how many seeds I planted. I don't know how many seeds he planted. But I can tell you this. I was never alone. And all during that week, here's what I'm saying. God, you was right. God, you was right. Thank you, God, for letting me come. But you know what? After a day or two of that, I was like, thank you, God, for letting me come. I'm not ashamed to say I was wrong. Amen. So what's he calling you to have a passion about? It, it might be a passion to go minister to somebody in the hospital, to go minister to somebody in a nursing home. It may be a passion to lead your neighbor to the Lord. It may be a passion to see your children come back home. It may be any kind of passion. But does it line up with God? If it lines up with God, 99% of the time God is calling you to do that. And here's what we say. Yes, Lord, like he said. Yes, Lord. Five minutes earlier, he would not have called Jesus Lord, y'all. Get this picture. Well, if he'll knock me down with a light, we got the light of the world right here. Amen. We got the light of the world right here. We have the Holy Spirit in us. Amen. What more do we need? Well, if God would just send me an email, well, let's see. <laughs> it's right here. Listen, y'all. This is Palm Sunday. Jesus rode in on a donkey. They're laying palm branches and they're hollering, praise him. And a few days later, they were hollering, crucify him. He rode in knowing you needed a Savior. He rode in knowing you needed the Holy Spirit. He rode in knowing you needed to be changed. So here's the question. Are you going to cry out, yes, Lord, this week? Or are you going to cry out, crucify him at the end of the week? Only you can answer that. He is calling you to something. Now, I don't know what it is, but he knows. And it will always get you out of your comfort zone. Always. And let me tell you, and I'm going to close with this. I can tell you why it will get you out of your comfort zone. Because every one of you are just like me. If he calls me to do something, Betty, and I can do it myself, I'm going to start doing this number. I'm a good guy. No, I'm not. I am a born-again Christian, saved by Jesus Christ, anointed to do His calling and called to do His will. Isn't that amazing? They, they had us write a mission statement. And so I'm, I'm up toward the front of the class and I wrote my mission statement. And this guy that's teaching it, and our, our company color is teal. Everybody knows teal is kind of bright. He's got on a teal suit. He's got on a teal tie. He's got on teal tennis shoes. He's got on teal sunglasses. And he walks over to me, and mine's there, and he stops. Hmm. And right over here is a microphone. He grabs that microphone, and I, whoop, 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 nope, not me. I don't like them microphones. You need to read that to the class. They need to hear your mission statement. I read it to the class. Everything that I wrote in my mission statement come out of God's Word. Every bit of it. Why did he stop at mine? I don't know. So listen, y'all. When, when, when God says, here's a microphone, don't be afraid to speak. When God says, get up and go, don't be afraid to start the car. I'm going to share this, and I'm through. I said that while I go. I lied. I'm sorry. The hardest thing about doing what God wants you to do is taking the first step. Taking the first step. 
when I got in that truck Sunday and closed the door and headed southeast, I was committed. And here's what I was saying. Okay, God, you got it. And he did have it. So what's he calling you? What's your passion? Nothing wrong in having bowling passion, Alabama football passion, the clean house passion, digging gray, or cemeteries, nothing wrong in that passion. But there's a greater calling, y'all. And how can you take your passion and channel God into it, see? Wouldn't that be great if every time you ran across an Alabama football fan, you shared the love of Jesus? Wow, think about that. Every time Connie throwed that ball, she said, let me tell you what Jesus did, buddy. Think about it. Every time Ricky and David Ponder shoot, go to the range, let me tell you about Jesus. Wouldn't that be amazing? Someone asked you to stand to your feet. Mary, would you come and play?